Welcome back friends. Welcome to another video tutorial from Shomus Bharaji. In this video lecture, we'll be talking about the cardiac anatomy. And mostly, we want to talk about the, the anatomy of heart. That's what we are going to uh, look for. Heart is, uh, as you all know, is one of the most important organ of our body. It's made up with several different types of tissues which are very much specialized to do their task. So heart is normally a transport system pump. We can make the analogy of heart with pump that delivers the roots uh, for the blood vessels. Now, in our whole body, we have different areas like, like let's say this is a brain. Brain is present. We have legs which are pretty far away from the brains. We have hands also far away from the legs and brains. So we need some something to pump and connect all these regions in a sense of transferring nutrients and also clearing all the toxic waste build up in the cells present in brain, legs, hands and different regions of our body. Now that is a transport system. In any city we also have transport system to connect the different regions of that city. Now in this case the transporter is blood which carries all the in important ingredients like blood carries the nutrients towards all the cells, somatic cells. Blood also carries the toxic wastes from those different regions of the cells towards uh, the filtering unit that is lungs. That's how this whole thing actually works. And the connection between this filtering unit with rest of the somatic cell is also mediated with the help of the centralized pump that is heart. Okay. So it uses the blood as a transport medium. It propels oxygen, nutrients, waste and other substances and past the body cells. That's the whole function of the heart. Now if you go, the goals for our learning is to review the anatomy of the heart to review the pulmonary and systemic circuits that are present and associated with the heart and to review the anatomy of cardiac muscle cells and why they are, they are performing the same task that they pretend to perform and how actually they are performing the task. If you look at the cell and their structure, we can find that out. The first thing we want to talk about is the structure of the heart an anatomy of the heart and if you look at the anatomy what we can find is from different level we can see different things and it's kind of a complex when uh, we actually tag to each of the different regions of the heart it's there are, it's com composed of so many tiny different regions that are present so in a major scale if i divide the heart into two different actually four different fragments one's horizontal division another one is a longitudinal division the longitudinal division divides it into two different fragments, right and left. And uh, in, the, in the horizontal division makes it uh, in the two different fragments like uh, antrium and ventricle. That is the two different parts that's also breaking it down. So if we look at here at very close proximity, what we can see here is the atrium here. This is atrium. This is another atrium. That is a horizontal division separates atrium which is on the top, ventricle are on the bottom. While we divide it longitudinally or it's a, you can say uh, vertically here. In that case what you can see in vertical claim, we can find a right side and a left side. So now we can say this part is a right atrium, this is the left atrium, this part a right ventricle that part left ventricle this is the major four sections that we can see this is much more clear if you look at from outside like this right atrium left atrium right ventricle left ventricle now if we go to much more details about the different regions that are present here you see in this between the right atrium and the right ventricle there is a specific type of muscles okay it's known as the cordy tendon that is the name of the muscle that holds the structures together in this sense. Now between this right atrium and right ventricle there is also some sort of valve present between. Valves are specific structures that can open in one side and can close at a specific side. 
Now the valve that is present between right atrium and right ventricle is known as tricuspid valve. Okay. And the same thing if you look at the left ventricle and left uh, left uh, atrium and left ventricle, we also have this. We also have the cordy tendony present there. But the valve that we see here is known as a bicuspid valve. There is a tricuspid there. It's bicuspid. It's also known as mitral or mitral valve. Okay. And there is a third kind of valve that is present in the junction of both this right atrium and right ventricle and this right ventricle towards the large artery that is known as the pulmonary artery. Between the pulmonary artery and uh, we have this um, region of the right ventricle, there is a specific valve known as pulmonary semilunar valve. This is the pulmonary semilunar valve. So valves are prepared so that it can open in only one direction that can guide the flow of the blood towards a specific direction only. For example, say if this is the tunnel, we have a valve that closes, that opens only in this direction of the arrow. So molecules or bloods, for example, that can move only towards the, this right hand side direction. Even if it will try to go backwards, it cannot because a valve will never open in the backward direction. So valves are there to maintain the unified single direction flow of the blood. Now there are different regions. The associated portion of the heart, there is also different pipes. So as it's a pump, it should have some pipes. Now pumps have several features. Pumps should produce and actually the, the energy of beating all the time like every pump should create some pressure that will allow the water or in this case blood to move that pressure is built inside the heart due to the heart muscle contraction and relaxation and we will see that later in the next videos and it also a pump is also connected with several different tubes or pipes okay those pipes that are associated here with this pump that is heart uh, some of them are pulmonary arteries, some of them are large arteries, different arteries uh, are present. Now, the pulmonary artery that we have, we have two types of pulmonary artery, left pulmonary artery and right pulmonary artery as, because they are fragmented, like divided into two different sections. And we also have another region called superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. Superior is going on the top, inferior is going on the bottom. So, Actually, we were destined to deliver this blood to different regions of the body that is on the top of the body as well as in the bottom part of the body. For that, we have this superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. And these are about the, the arteries. Now about the veins, because you know all the arteries that we are talking about, those arteries are designed to normally distribute the blood to rest of our body. While uh, if you look at here in this case, this is aorta, the, the large, this is the aorta and this aorta is connected again and veins are normally performing uh, the task of taking up waste related or waste filled blood towards the heart. That's the function of the vein and we have pulmonary vein, left pulmonary vein and right pulmonary vein just like the pulmonary arteries. And this is the aorta and this is called aortic arch because it forms like an arch. And this is the aorta which is connecting so many different regions of our body. So this is the major unit of the pump. And if you consider it as a pump, these are the major pipes that are fitted to the pump. Now rest of the pipes that we will attach, it will go from all these regions and distribute to the rest of our body. And there is a sequential distribution of uh, all those uh, distribution of those, those pipes and those uh, arteries and veins and venules and all these things that we will talk about in a moment later. Another thing I must talk about here is between the this this why we have four different segments actually in heart if you look at the the heart muscle it's it's so muscular and we call it endocardium this endocardium layer is much thicker in the ventricular area if you see that in the in a atrium area it is present but very thin this is the area very very thin but here it's very thick in the ventricle and this endocardium is actually making a septum between the right and left ventricle and the septum that is formed here between the left and right ventricle this is known as the interventricular septum it's known as the interventricular septum 
and also you will see that uh, in this uh, they need to interact with all this atrium and ventricle and to keep the structure tight or, and connected with each other they also have several different tiny muscles some of them are called as this cordy tendony and some of them are also known as uh, papillary muscles that are also present in this uh, in this ventricles so now let's let's see if we look at the pipes and pump analogy it actually have two different sides if I, for the summary the blood vessels are the pipes that carry the blood throughout the body the right atrium and the right ventricle pumps the right atrium and right ventricle they pumps oxygen poor carbon dioxide rich blood to the lungs so that lungs can filter it in the lungs the blood receives oxygen eliminates carbon dioxide and travels back to the left atrium of the heart so that goes there to the lungs co2 is released oxygen is added now that is carried through and we have oxygenated blood in the right atrium, uh, left atrium. From the left atrium, the oxygen rich carbon dioxide poor blood is pumped out to the body, to the left ventricle, and then is the body, whole body receives that throughout this place. Through this area, it will be transferred to the rest of the body with oxygenated blood. That's how the whole pump machine is actually working. So the circulation process, if you think, if you look at the circulation process again from the beginning, you can see the oxygen poor blood is pumped from the right side of the heart to the lungs and here it receives oxygen and travels back to the heart. So here it comes, the carbon dioxide reach, it will go to the lungs, filtered, oxygen is added, then it will be transferred to the left atrium, then that blood is transferred to the rest of the body which carries a lot of oxygen that is in a sense the direction of blood flow okay and this is another image uh, that is telling you without any cross section of heart that's uh, from outside exactly how it looks like in different regions now one thing you also see there is a the intrinsic conduction system of heart as well which is delivering the nutrients and also really, uh, removing toxins from the heart cells or heart muscle cells as well which is another very very important point to be noted because this is the intrinsic because heart cells and muscles also need the oxygen also need the nutrients to function properly so that is why it is thing so it's very simple to analyze the whole thing is ab about a pump and pipe where carbon dioxide uh, added carbon dioxide rich blood comes in it's getting transferred to the to the lungs lungs filter that for oxygen oxygenated blood comes in comes into the left atrium transferred to the left ventricle through the aorta it distributes to the rest of the body so that's how the whole thing works as a pump now this is again uh, the circulation process distributed in details where we have the used blood denoted with the blue arrow and the fresh blood denoted with the red arrow there the same way if you look at the follow the direction of the blood you can find the whole process going on and in this circuit you can uh, understand the whole process in much more details as you see the heart is linked with uh, the lungs it has two different left and right uh, arteries and veins for, for the lungs to be attached with lungs is acting as a filter which uh, substitutes carbon dioxide with oxygen which is a good one which we require so once oxygen is added that is transferred uh, to the heart and then the rest of the part of the heart is transported to the rest of the part and then uh, tissues and cells receive oxygen and stuff now once they start building up carbon dioxide they transfer that through the same process and again the blood will uh, sorry they transfer that through the same process and then again bring it to the to the heart and rest of the process will begin now if you look at the cardiac histology that is the cardiac muscle cells and how they are looking uh, like like how they structure and function it will give us some interesting idea the cardiac histology if you look three things you, you should understand very clearly one is the nucleus that is one of the important thing that we should see this is the nucleus this is the area of nucleus that is present so they are nucleated cell second thing we can easily see is called intercalated discs that are present between the the inside the cell you'll see there's some dot like 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 stripe like structures these are known as the intercalated discs okay 
this is another thing and cardiac myofibrils cardiac myofibrils is another part that is making the the heart cells or this heart tissue that much fibrous and effective all the time now there are two kinds of cell junctions and intercalated discs that are present in the heart that's making the cells beating all the time without any issue so if you look again in a schematic drawing this is the nucleus we have the mitochondria a lot of mitochondria is required inside the heart cell so that they can develop and generate a lot of ATP a lot of energy for the purpose of the heart to pump out the blood throughout our lifespan and the intercalated disc have a specific functions now what we can see if we zoom in here the intercalated disc that we see ultimately it's nothing but the formation of desmosomes and little of gap junctions together so it has desmosomes and gap junctions attached one after another the desmosomes are anchoring junctions that hold these adjacent cells together when the muscle cell contracts they pull each other so the idea is you know once they are contracting they pull on each other so if it is not any desmosome if there is no desmosome present the heart would literally pull itself apart during its job that means let's assume these are the cells that are added one after another this is the basement of the tissue now during the contraction the heart will stretch all these cells together now as we are stretching it from the two different and opposite ends we need to have a proper stitching materials in between if we have a proper stitching materials in between then those cells will remain constant then those cells will be remain attached with each other without any issue otherwise those cells will pull themselves apart and they will form gaps in between and the whole heart will be dissociated by its own energy and force that's not at all we want and also there is a gap junction present the gap junctions allow the stimulation impulse to move from one cell to the adjacent cells. It's a kind of a cell-cell interaction. Once we start the process of heart beating, as we know, that information is transferred from one cell to the next cell and slowly through the entire unit of the heart so that the heart can process it. And so the heart, the complete heart can actually work on it, right? So if each cardiac muscle cell were allowed to do its on your own, the heart would be useless as a pump. The heart can only be used as a pump because once the chemical signal is generated in one cell, is propagated through the consequent cell to cell interactions and that is possible due to these gap junctions. That's why the presence of the desmosomes and gap junctions play a vital role. Now what happens in the desmosome? It's two nearby cells are stitched. How? Because there are specific structures called cadherins. Cadherin proteins are, are linked. They're forming some sort of structure like hooks. So let's assume two hooks are involved with two different cells. So they are anchored with each other. And those anchoring proteins are known as catenins, which are embedded into the cells. So think of that. They are cell number one, cell number two. Catenins is anchored. And, and cadherin is attached to the catenin and holding themselves together as a hook hook interaction that is a cell cell interaction that's holding the structure not only that but also some sort of intermediate filament which is a structure of cytoskeleton that is also attached there in between the cells in between the junctions that's make the cell junction much stable and right after this this desmosomes we have a little amount of gap junctions present through which and they can transport uh, those chemical signal from one cell to the next. So that's all about uh, the cardiac histology and cardiac anatomy. For summarizing the whole thing, I can tell you that heart consists of four chambers, the right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium and left ventricle. The right atrium receives oxygen poor blood from the systemic veins, blood moves to the right ventricle and it is pumped out of the pulmonary arteries to the lungs. Now the left atrium receives oxygenated blood from the pulmonary veins, blood moves to the left ventricle and is pumped out of the systemic arteries to the rest of the body tissues. That's the idea of 
the heart and how heart pumps. Now for pumping all these things, they need to generate a lot of energy. For that, they should have a lot of mitochondria present inside those cells, inside those heart cells. And not only the mitochondria, but they also have some sort of intracellular, intercellular junctions. And those intercellular junctions, they have desmosomes followed by gap junctions in repeated unit, while desmosome functions in proper stretch and stitching of the nearby cells so that they can, they can actually remain healthy during this contraction of the heart. And the gap junctions will allow them to transfer uh, chemical signaling that actually helps in the process of contraction from one cell to the adjacent cell. That in a sense is the cardiac anatomy. We have been talking about the cardiac physiology and uh, the anatomy and physiology of the cardiovascular system and blood circulatory system. In this video, I will be talking about the blood vessel anatomy. Right? In the last video, we talked about the heart anatomy. So now let's talk about the blood vessel anatomy and uh, the different types of blood vessels, their structure and their function. Blood vessels of the body forms a closed delivery system that starts with the heart and also ends in the heart. Right? So this is the heart which is the pump present at the middle of all circulatory system in our body and rest of the thing is connected with this blood vessels. So these are the blood vessels and blood vessel carries the blood away from heart and also provides the heart and bring the blood back to the heart. So whatever blood we have in our body should be pumped using the heart through two different area. One is the somatic cells, the cells of our body and second is the lungs because lungs officially is a filtration unit of the blood. Because inside the cell, carbon dioxide is generated and cell can take oxygen. So once carbon dioxide generated inside the cell, that should be carried away from the cell to the heart, to the lungs, so that lungs can filter it and put oxygen into it. Then that oxygenated blood again pumped into the cells through heart. And that's how the process works. But this is a closed delivery system because the process of delivery starts and ends in the heart. So the goal of our learning is to describe the general structure of the blood vessel walls, which is playing an important role for delivering blood as well as important role for blood pressure. Okay. To compare and contrast the type of blood vessels that we know, to relate the blood pressure in various parts of the vascular system to differences between the blood vessel structure. Okay, That's what we need to know. So if we talk about the general structure of the blood vessel walls, what we will find? All the blood vessels except for the very smallest one have the three distinct layer. Three layers are present throughout. One is tunica intima, tunica media, tunica externa. That's the three different structures that all of them should have. This is known as tunics. That's the membrane that surrounds, right? Tunics surround the central blood containing space. That is the lumen. Now, there are three types of such tunics, as I told you. The first one, tunica intima. It's the innermost tunic. As you can see, tunica intima is the innermost, this one, this one. We are looking at the structure of artery vein. For, ca for capillary, we don't have these three different layers. That's why I told you, except for the very thin and the thinnest one, that's the capillary. Except for that, all of them have this. So tunica intima is the innermost tunic. It is the intimate contact between the blood and the wall. Okay, So it is in direct contact with the wall, direct contact with the blood in the lumen okay, of the vessel. It includes the endothelium that lines the lumen of all the vessels. You see this is the endothelial layers containing with those flat cells, surface cells. 
okay it covers is all vessels forming a smooth and friction reducing line that's the job of tunica intima they are endothelial cells they also some sub endothelial cells associated with that and also some elastic membrane present in those cells that makes the tunica intima second one is the tunica media this is the middle layer that's why media consists of mostly circularly like circularly arranged smooth muscle cells that you can see here this is the tunica media this one and so this one it's little thicker than uh, the tunica intima okay it's made with again smooth muscle cells and sheet of elastin that elastin will help to like to to hold on to the pressure that is exaggerated on the on the top of this blood vessel wall okay the muscle cell contract and relax where is the elastin allows the vessel to stretch and recoil that's the whole idea that's why it has all of them have a some some sort of uh, elastic membrane outside so there is a layer then the elastic membrane this muscle layer will help them for the contraction but elastin will allow them to stretch so they can contract and stretch so as they have both of this contraction and stretching they can actually manage to hold on to so much of blood flow and blood pressure okay and tunica externa another name for tunica externa is tunica adventitia adventitia that this is the outermost layer and composed of loosely added collagen fibers as you see this is a collagen fiber mediated and also it protects the blood vessel okay protect this blood vessels and anchor it to the surrounding structures that are present blood vessels are not present unit uh, manner like it's not like uh, it's not present in a single unique uh, fashion they are sometimes attached or attached with most of the tissues and tissue layers outside this attachment of the blood vessels because if you see the heart structure you'll see there's intrinsic conduct conduction system of the heart if i draw it like there's some structure those intrinsic conduction system of, of the heart is telling you that that they also have their own blood vessel and stuff which are attached to the tissue of the heart from outside so in this case those artery and vein needs to be attached with some accessory tissue and that attachment and anchorage is done with the help of tunica intertissia or tunica externa okay now if we look at the comparison between the artery and vein what you will find if you see here in this picture it's going to tell you a little idea about it but if you go here it's going to tell you a greater idea about the part we are looking at artery vein and capillary three of the things we are looking and we are comparing these three things together so what we can tell now arteries are vessels that transports blood away from the heart so it starts with a artery and transfers the blood away from the heart remember that as they are exposed to the highest pressure of any vessels they have to have a thickest tunica media if you look at here this is the inner layer intima this is media so you have very thick tunica media layer because they need to have they need to like uh, hold on to a, a huge amount of pressure okay the elastin they also have in the tunica media that allows them to stretch and recoil and the smooth muscle allows them to con like uh, to constrict and dilate from time to time so this amount of versatility is required towards an artery because it's carrying a lot of blood that can create a huge pressure now if we talk about the capillaries these are the smallest vessels of all and the link between arteries and veins are made with the capillaries in the, in, in the in the pathway of blood capillary walls are consisting of the thin very thin tunica intima layer only so that's why they are very ideally suited for their role which is the exchange of material 
with the nearby cells so the idea is you know it comes artery and vein and in the middle they forms this capillary so capillary is surrounded by all those body cells somatic cells so what they are doing here is that those capillary are going to release all those nutrients to the nearby cells so that they can uptake that and the cells are also providing carbon dioxide and all those toxic waste to the capillaries which are cleared by the capillaries to the rest of the part pumped through the through the heart that's the job of the capillary so capillary is involved with the function where diffusion is required to transfer certain amount of nutrients and oxygen and carbon dioxide so they should have a very thin cell layer and they actually have very thin cell layer there's an only single cell layer made up with this endothelial cells which is just like the tunica intima type of cells nothing else okay and the third one is the veins they are the furthest from the heart as the veins are furthest from the heart so they experience least amount of blood pressure so their walls are thinner than arterial walls that we saw earlier so see all their walls especially the middle one very very thin compared to the arterial intima media okay and the walls are thinner but the walls in their lumen size is much bigger as they have a larger lumen size it allows them to accommodate a large amount of blood okay and that is required because they will be transferring that blood to the rest of our body so they can accommodate a huge amount of blood there okay and their third layer that is tunica externa that is the heaviest wall layer in the veins rest of the layers are thinner they have the highest and healthiest tunica externa or tunica adventitia okay here you see at any given moment about 30% of the blood in your systemic circulation will be found in the arteries 5% only in the capillaries 65% in the brains so veins need to have a lot of area so that the blood can accommodate that can be transferred and if you look at a cross section of the vein you see vein and artery cross section you see one one important thing that beside this thick and thinness of this different layers you will also find in the veins you have valves that is absent in the artery why we need valves in the brain vein because vein carries mostly carbon dioxide filled blood as they find carbon dioxide filled but they need to transfer it very fast to the to the heart through that heart they need to pump it to the lungs to to make it transferred to the oxygen and purified so as they carry lot of carbon dioxide containing blood so they needs to flow that towards a specific direction which i am drawing it this is the arrow towards this direction they will flow the blood that's why the valve is added it's like a single way open gate through which the blood can move as their carbon dioxide reach blood if there is any sort of reverse pressure of the blood and the blood try to force and flow reverse way this valve is going to prevent it and that's very important because if they have this reverse flow of the blood of the carbon dioxide added blood that can go back to the cells that's what we never want so to prevent that veins should have this valves otherwise rest of the things are same now if you look at the three groups of arteries it starts with we talk about arteries and vein in separate parts so in the first slide here we talking about arteries and we have three different groups of them we have elastic arteries we have muscular arteries and we have arterioles that's how we can divide them based on their little modification in their structure and their function mostly the function is same but little modification in their structure there are the three things we have now it starts with the heart goes to elastic arteries then to the muscular arteries then to the arterioles through the arterioles it finally receives in capillaries after capillaries we have the veins 
and in the veins we also have two different parts like venules and vein and then finally it returns to the heart remember that so if you look at the first one elastic arteries it's known as the aorta or branches that begins from the heart remember this is the aorta that is associated with the heart and this structure is known as aortic arch right so elastic arteries are the closest to the heart and experience the greatest amount of pressure as the heart forces the blood into them that's the very thing so very high pressure is observed in the elastic arteries okay now they have the greatest amount of elastin present there so that they can expand in this huge pressure that's the structural modification now when the heart relaxes the recoil propels the bird blood onwards to the forward direction that's why the recoiling feature is also required for the elastic arteries if you look at the cross section of this artery you will see a lot of elastin which can be seen by wavy fibers and they also have a very thick tunica media in present that's why you require all these things in elastic arteries that's what unique about elastic arteries very high pressure the deal with that elastin is present a lot okay and they have a thick tunica media the second one is a muscular artery here you see the structure of muscular artery as well this was the elastic artery structure thickest tunica media that is present there and lot of elastin that is present in the intima okay now in the muscular artery we also have these three different parts but in the elastic artery the elastin forms most of the wall of the tunica media but in the muscular artery the tunica media is composed of mainly smooth muscle here most of this tunica media is smooth muscle and elastin remember okay so muscular artery is that's why its name is muscular artery because the tunica media is made with mostly smooth muscles and very less elastin okay muscular artery is deliver blood to the specific body organ the specific organ okay that's what they have the destination now they have relatively more smooth muscle and less elastin than the elastic arteries in the tunica media as we talked earlier now they also have something called vasomotor fiber vasomotor fibers are from the sympathetic nervous system that regulates the activity of the smooth muscle in the muscular arteries so here you see lot of those vas vasomotor fiber to be present from the sympathetic nervous system now depending upon the needs of the body this vasomotor fibers can cause the vasoconstriction or vasodilatation depending upon the requirement vasoconstriction means vasoconstriction means the reduction in the area of the lumen this is the contraction where the lumen size is decreased and vasodilatation means when the lumen si size is decreased so it is vasodilatation this is vasoconstriction okay there are several factors in our body those are called complement factors c5a c3a these are known as anaphylactic agents these anaphylactic agents can cause vasodilatation so as in different allergic reactions we have uh, vasodilatation done okay so here this small change in the blood vessel diameter can greatly influence the blood flow and blood pressure and that makes the muscular arteries the crucial in regarding the circulatory dynamics that we are going to see while the sympathetic nerve to the smooth muscle or muscular arteries they fire the vasoconstriction occurs which narrows the lumen of the artery now if you have a lack in the sympathetic stimulation it causes the vasodilatation which increases the area of the lumen of the artery that's what is all about muscular artery because it's like a muscle that is regulated by sympathetic nervous system okay 
now the third one is arteriole arterioles are the smallest of the arteries and the larger arterioles have all three different layers but the tunica media is consist of very thin and tiny layer of cells and this cells in tunica media is mainly smooth muscle cells okay and they are narrow so what we can see in elastic artery it's it's like very big in a muscular artery is somewhat like that it can constrict uh, this area and then finally tunica and arteriole will be much thinner and after that we'll have the capillary which will be very very thin and then it will begin with the vein system like that so this is how it goes so from a larger pipe to a little small from that further small for that further small this is how the distribution and branches are actually divided okay this is the structure of muscular artery that we saw here earlier regarding the whole process of muscular artery that we have the nerves uh, present tunica media is the most important part where the sympathetic nervous system controls that this is the actual histogram and this is the structure in schematic representation if you look at the arterial structure now now arterioles as we told you it's it's a very thin one compared to the rest of the part of the artery which is a much bigger it has a very thinner tunica media and the thinner layer of tunica media contains only smooth muscle most of it now the feeder arterioles bring blood directly to the capillary bed this is known as capillary bed capillary bed is a, is a construction between arteriole and venule where lot of body cells are residing together the somatic cells are residing and this is the last arrangement of the transport there is no further branch from here so whatever nutrients the cell needs to take whatever oxygen the cell needs to take they need to take from here okay so there is not at all direct very interaction or con, uh, interaction between the cells with the with the capillaries but capillaries are present almost every single region of our body except for few regions but still body manages to take the all the required things from the blood using the capillaries that is known as the capillary bed the interaction between arteriole and venule and there is the tissue okay now a widened feeder arteriole will allow the blood to flow to the capillary bed because you know if the if it's wider it can flow a lot of blood there now where is when the feeder arteriole narrows down less blood will flow to the capillary bed so you can control actually body controls the process of the blood that will flow to the capillary bed if it widens it more blood will flow if it narrows down less blood will flow now depending upon the amount of blood flows the blood pressure is changed in the arterioles right the smallest drop in the blood pressure occurs in arterioles and the arterioles offer greatest amount of resistance to the blood flow okay now in this area blood flow flow no longer pulses by the time it gets to the arterioles that is another very important so it breaks down all the pulses and only limited amount of blood and and the body decides what amount of blood actually will go to the capillary bed that's why the arteriole comes in play okay this is a structure of the arteriole denoted with the endothelium cells and capillary that's how it looks like okay it is the association point where the capillary begins and there are three groups of so this is all about approximately like Uh, like arterioles that we know now if we go to capillaries and their function right after the arteriole we have very thin unilayer most of the time unilayer arrangement of endothelial cells that is known uh, now those cells arrange themselves to form what is called capillary capillaries consist of only a thin tunica intima layer only no other layers it's called endothelium the tunica 
intima layer most of the capillaries are arranged in capillary bed that we talked earlier that vein and artery comes together and there is a there is a construction like a net where the cells will be present that's known as the capillary bed okay now if you look at the structure here you'll see the cells are arranged one after another through which different nutrients can pass it can diffuse out through which oxygen can easily diffuse out carbon dioxide can easy, easily diffuse out all these things are possible in this single layer of endothelium that's why it's very important to transfer oxygen and nutrients to the nearby cells and taking carbon dioxide from the nearby cells into the endothelium or into these capillaries this is the construction of a capillary bed you have different structures one called as the feeder arterial feeder arterioles are specific arterial that will feed blood to the artery bed or capillary bed okay now in this case the blood flow with the help of the feeder arteriole is properly regulated okay the shunt is a short vessel that directly connected to the feeder arteriole and the drainage venule so what is the idea is that you can see here there are pre capillary sphincters present that will prevent the blood to flow flow back and that will also exaggerate a little amount of pressure that will regulate the movement of the blood so when the these sphincters are open they can provide blood to the all of the bed of the capillary but whenever all the sphincters are closed they makes only one way passage through which the blood can flow so with the help of all these sphincters they can actually control in which direction the blood will flow okay that's very important if this one is open and rest of them are closed that means the blood will flow in two directions only this and this right so it's like like a lock gate that is created in the capillary bed due to this this cap pre capillary sphincters that can control this whole process and that is present in the arteriole that's an important job of arteriole to control okay now the exchange of materials that take place between the tissue cells and the blood cells is there in the capillaries okay and this this sphincters that we are talking about they are nothing nothing but smooth muscle fibers that are surrounded by the root of each true capillaries and acting as a valve to allow or block the blood okay now when the pre capillary sphincters constrict the blood is delivered away from the true capillaries but materials do not exchange between the blood and the tissue remember that when it is relaxed then only the material will be transferred between the blood and the tissue okay now if we talk about the blood pressure in the capillaries blood pressure is relatively low in the capillaries because you know the blood is being transferred and from so many different stages and now it's there at the very end point though it's very thinner so blood uh, pressure should be exaggerated but it's broken by several different portions of the blood vessel high pressures can rupture this capillaries that's why it's very important to maintain a limited amount of blood pressure there and high pressures will also force this excessive amount of solute containing fluid out of the blood stream into the interstitial space that can also create irritation and so many consequences and problems to the human okay that's why it's very important to create it a low pressure and that is created with the help of this terminal arteriole pre terminal sphincters as well as the arteriole and how they distributed one after another now if you look at venules and veins the venules are the smallest like they formed when the capillaries unite together that's how the venules formed so here comes 
the arterial and distribution and then we have all those capillaries attached with each other and they will form what is called a venule. Okay. In the venule we have a high pressure, uh, we should not have a high pressure sorry because if you have again high pressure it can rupture the venule and that will be bad because here the capillaries are fragile and this is one part of the capillary in this case. Okay. And in larger venules both the area of tunica media uh, it is kind of sparse and, and the tunica adventitia is very thin that is present. So, in venule you can see three different layers, but the layers are thin the tunica media as well as tunica in uh, external. Okay. Now, these venules are the like smallest venules, they drain these capillaries and they will take that ultimately carry all these materials to the large vein. Okay. Now, blood pressure continues to drop as we travel from artery towards vein, that is very very true because as the blood is moving from hearts away from the heart, the pressure will be very very reduced. That is true because if you are putting a pump and the pumping the pump is providing the water in a, in a pressure, the pressure of water exaggerated very close to the pump will be much higher to the very distant to the pump. So, as we are moving from arteries through capillaries to veins, the pressure is continuously decreasing. So, the pressure that we see in the vein and venule is far less than the pressure we saw earlier in the arterial or artery. Okay? Now, if we zoom into a little bit, if you see here the venule and vein both are illustrated actually. This is the structural arrangement with arteries, arteriole, capillary, venule and vein. So, we talked about venules. Now, vein if you look, they have contracting skeletal muscles that can put some pressure on these veins to deliver the blood in a specific direction that may possible. And we also know that veins contain valves inside to regulate the unidirectional blood flow. So that even if the blood flows back, it should not go towards the capillary, it can be prevented. So if you look at the veins, veins are the joint form of the venules, that is for sure. Veins also have three distinct tunics layer, we already saw that earlier. But the layer of tunica media is not that thick compared to the tunica media of arteries. Okay. But veins have a very thick tunica externa or tunica adventitia because they will be holding all the structures together so the blood can move because they have to carry a lot of blood together. So, they have a higher space in their lumen to carry a lot of blood. Okay. Now, if we talk about the blood pressure that is present in vein, the blood pressure will be considerably low compared to the blood pressure of arteries because the blood is going away from the heart. So, the heart is the pump, so the veins are present very away from it. So, it will be less blood pressure shown there. Now, as the blood pressure is low, they can have thinner wall than arteries without any danger of the bursting. Now, the low pressure in the vein requires special type of adaptation to help the blood to the heart, to return the blood to the heart. So, for that process, as they have very less pressure, who will force the blood to go towards the heart? That is one thing to understand. So, veins are going towards the heart, I earlier mentioned away from the heart, actually away means it is distantly placed from the heart, but it is moving the blood towards the heart. So, who will exaggerate this pressure, who will put the pressure so that the blood will flow towards the heart, as they do not have that much of blood pressure like the arteries. So, the answer for that, they have specific pump to do that. Okay. One is known as the venous pump. Another one is known as the muscular pump. 
Here you see one example of such muscular pump. So both venous pump and muscular pump help as well as there is another pump known as respiratory pump. All of these pumps assist them to put this blood towards the heart. If you look at this picture, it's going to give us an idea about it. For this venous return, we have a skeletal muscle pump, respiratory pump and how they are actually working. Let's say this is the vein and the blood is flowing through this direction through the venules. They have valves that will not allow the blood to force back. That's, that's fine. But how you keep the blood going in the forward direction? Now you see there are skeletal muscles present that can contract. Now if the skeletal muscles contract there, it will keep pushing the area of the blood vessel, the area of the vein that will constrict the vein in specific regions that can force the blood to move in a specific direction. So here we see the role of three different pumps and their features of helping the blood to be pumped towards the direction of heart. Okay, And uh, one of the pump is this venous valves that we call venous valves that is present the valve uh, present in the venules and veins. Now these venous valves are hinge like apps that form from the folds in the tunica intima. If you look at the structure very clearly, the tunica intima is folded to make the structure of a valve. That's what the venous valve is really about. And the, the fashion of the venous valve is that it will open in only in one direction. And this is the most abundant in veins of the limbs where the upward flow of the blood is opposed by the gravity and that's what's very very important. Okay. Now, second type of pumps are the muscular pump or skeletal muscle pump. Okay. In this muscular pump, the contracting skeletal muscles press against the veins that force the blood to move towards a specific direction, whether the direction is on the top or at the bottom here in the leg, but ultimately it will do that. So, these muscles also play a vital role. That's why massaging the body can help in your proper blood flow okay and the third type is a respiratory pump it actually helps to move the blood to the right atrium how because the pressure changes occurring in the ventricle body or the ventral body if you look at here that uh, the heart or if you look at the part of our body the if the pressure changes that's going on in the ventral body Uh, that during the breathing, it creates the respiratory pump that sucks the blood upward towards the heart. Okay. So, as we inhale, the pressure in the thoracic cavity decreases. Meanwhile, the pressure increases in the abdominal cavity. Remember, as the pressure increases in the abdominal cavity, squeezing abdominal veins, this creates a sucking effect that pull the blood towards the heart. That is another very important thing. So, the process of respiration is not only dealing with the process of taking oxygen releasing carbon dioxide, but it also indirectly affects the movement and the flow of blood through the veins towards the heart. That is what we talk about. It moves the blood into the right atrium because it creates a pressure to the abdominal veins. So, for a summary what we can say of the three types of vessels. Arteries have the thickest tunica media which allows uh, the artery to stretch, recoil and vasoconstrict. Veins have the relatively thick tunica adventitia and capillaries are the thinnest of all which forms the capillary bed through which uh, the nutrients and oxygen and those gaseous substances are diffused and exchanged. Okay. In this video lecture, we will be talking about cardiac cycle. We have been talking about the cardiac physiology for a couple of videos, last couple of videos. This is uh, one of the video regarding the cardiac cycle which is one of the very very important topic from the whole cardiac system. You know our heart works like a pump. So it's pumping all the time and providing uh, the blood to the rest of the body as well as it, it supplies the blood uh, to the lungs for the blood to be filtered. Right. So the carbon dioxide will be 
replaced with oxygen in the blood and then again that oxygenated blood will be supplied to the rest of the body organs so that they get the oxygen and all the nutrients. Now cardiac cycle includes all the events that are related to the flow of blood through the heart okay, during the complete heartbeat process. That's what the cardiac cycle is. So let's look at the, the goals of our learning. The goals of our learning is to list the different phases of the cardiac cycle in the constant process in a consecutive order. Then to recognize that the pressure changes determine valve action inside the heart and how those valves actually perform for guiding the direction of the blood through the heart. And the third thing is to relate the ECG and the heart sounds to the events of the cardiac cycle. Okay, these are the three things we want to know. We will see how exactly heart is pumping the blood and once it's pumping the blood, uh, how exactly that's relating with the graph that we actually determine by uh, from outside of, of our body that will help us to understand whether our heart is working properly or not. So we will see all these three things together. Normally if you look at this picture, you'll have an idea about what heart pumping or cardiac cycle is all about. Cardiac cycle involves in several consecutive processes which are continuous process one after another that sequential events starts with you know we have heart and heart have two different types of compartments atrium and ventricle there is a contraction of the atrium and then relaxation then again ventricle will also be relaxation and contraction so the relaxation and contraction cycle carried out for both the atrium and the ventricle this one so this relaxation and, and contraction of heart of different compartments of heart ultimately allows the blood to move uh, from the atrium to ventricle and then ventricle to the rest of the part either lungs or rest of the body okay that's what we will be looking so for understanding the process of cardiac cycle one must know different heart valves valves are you know different type of structure that that's like a gate which will open in only one direction for example if this is the tunnel and this is the two different valves forming a gate let's say the valve will only open in this direction in the upward direction here so if we want to do it from the backward it will not open it will remain closed so it's a one-way gated door so during the cardiac cycle, these heart valves open and close in response to the differences in the blood pressure. Okay, and the blood pressure will be different in two different sides. In this case, if the blood pressure is high, is this bottom side and low in the top side. In that case, the blood will pressurize this valve to open because it can open in that direction. It can uh, help the blood to flow. Now, if it reverses, that means uh, the upper region is high, lower is low. So in that case, blood will try to flow down side but the valve will not open so it will be closed and there will be huge amount of blood pressure applied to the closed valve that can generate a sound which you also see in case of heart there is a sound known as lap dub that sound is also formed due to the closure of those valves due to the blood pressure okay now there are different types of heart valves associated okay four different valves we will require to understand about aortic valve tricuspid valve, bicuspid valve or mitral valve and pulmonary valve. Okay, These are the four types of valve that are involved with. Now if you look at here, the tricuspid valve is present between the right atrium and the right ventricle. The bicuspid or mitral valve is present between the left atrium and the left ventricle. And pulmonary valve is present between uh, here you see that uh, the left atrium, uh, the right atrium that is the part and the pulmonary uh, and the pulmonary vein okay in between uh, this uh, right uh, ventricle and the pulmonary vein that is the region and uh, the pulmonary and, and, the, and the aortic valve is present between this left ventricle and aorta okay which will supply the blood to the rest of the part of the body so these are the different four segments and four different valves that are present so they work like a lock gate you know 
lock gates are very important that controls the movement of specific things. In this case, the lock gate between uh, this tricuspid valve is actually controlling the blood flow from the right atrium to right ventricle. Bicuspid or mitral valve is regulating the blood flow from the left atrium to left ventricle. Aortic valves are controlling the blood flow from the left ventricle to the rest of the body through aorta and uh, pulmonary valve is regulating the blood flow from the right ventricle to the lungs. These are the different lock gates that are present which will open in only one direction. For example, this uh, tricuspid will open up on the in this towards the right ventricle that direction. Bicuspid will open towards the left ventricle that is the arrow of the direction. As you see tricuspid will open here, bicuspid will open here. Pulmonary valve will open in this direction of uh, towards the lungs that direction. Aortic valve will open towards the aortic arch okay that is the open process. The reverse region will not make them open that will remain closed okay. Now if you look at the overview of the cardiac cycle what we know about it. There are different phases of the cardiac cycle okay. Now different books are, are listing those phases as different things. For example in this picture it is listed only two different major phenomena ventricular diastole and ventricular systole. Diastole means the ventricular filling that is the filling of the ventricle with blood. Systole is the pressure applied and the ventricle will release the blood that enters into it okay. These are the two major divisions that we can form or in most of the cases they list three different part. First is the ventricular filling or ventricular diastole, second is the ventricular systole and then third one they list is the isovolumetric, isovolumetric relaxation. That is the third part uh, sometimes they refer that occurs during the early process of the uh, ventricular filling just between the ventricular diastole and ventricular systole that is the process uh, after the ventricular systole before the ventricular diastole okay. Now let us look at the process in, in series you see at the very beginning that is known as a ventricular filling this is a passive process by the way passive means you do not require any of the force or energy to drive this blood inside the ventricle. So what we have here uh, ventricular filling is that we have blood in the atrium that is present in both right and left atrium. Now they have different types of blood in right and left atrium where you know the blue is the mostly carbon uh, dioxide filled blood while oxygenated blood is designated with this red colored blood. So what we are doing here is the blood is being transferred from the atrium into the ventricle. It is known as a ventricular filling known as a passive filling as well okay that is the first part of uh, the process. Now it occurs during the mid to late diastole phase when the heart chambers are relaxed okay and blood flows passively into the atria through the different valves. Valves means the AV valves that are present in the between the atrium and ventricle known as atrioventricular valve example tricuspid valve and mitral valve. Okay, those valve will open and the blood will flow. Now the second one is the atrial con contraction. Okay, then atrium will contract. That's the end point of the ventricular uh, diastole. So what will happen here? Atria contract, forcing the remaining blood to go into the ventricle. Okay, so atria will start to contract there, and all the remaining blood will flow to the ventricle. Blood flows through both sides of the heart at the same time. Okay. Now the third one that is a ventricular systole, a part of ventricular systole, and first is a contraction, that is a closure of AV valves. You know, once the blood is completely transferred from atrium to the ventricle, now atrium is free from blood, and now the blood is very much pressurized in the ventricle. So the blood may try to escape away by going backwards. But as we know that there is two different valve, there, is, there are uh, this tricuspid valve and mitral valve which will not open in this upward direction. So they will remain closed, they will shut, shut down the process of the blood movement. Okay. So there is an AV valve closure that takes place here. Then after that, so this is, this is uh, one very important event. So we call it also isovolumetric contraction that ventricles contract and intraventricular pressure arises that close that AV valves right 
So briefly we can say the ventricles are completely closed chambers now at this point of time. Now it's time to go for the process known as ejection that will be ejecting the blood to the destination points. So ventricular ejection is a rising ventricular pressure that forces uh, those other valves known as semilunar valves and all those pulmonary valves as well uh, to open because we know they can open in this upward direction and they will take the blood out from the heart like through the pulmonary uh, vein it will take this uh, blood to the to the lungs and to the aortic arch it will lead to the blood to the rest of the body okay so that's how the whole thing will work there and finally at the end we know we have a isovolumetric relaxation that i talked earlier when the ventricles relax and ventricular pressure drops then blood start to flow back into the ventricle uh, like uh, ventricle pressure drops in that case so so what we say here is ventricles totally closed off again okay ventricles will be closed off again totally because those valves those other valves will remain uh, like closed because once the blood is transferred to the destination which is lungs and rest of the body now those other valves like pulmonary valves and semilunar valves also gets closed so now the ventricles will be free of blood and it will be closed compartment all again then again we'll go to the atrial filling so atrial filling means while the atri have been filling with blood slowly passively that's a passive filling we know the atrial pressure exceeds the ventricular pressure and atrial valves open and ventricular filling again or the phase one will start to happen from the beginning again so what we go on this cycle repeats and continuously start to happen what happens here is atrium gets the passive blood then it will be transferring to the ventricle close closure of the av valves then ventricle will open the pulmonary valve and semilunar valve the blood flows out then again they will close the pulmonary and semilunar valve then again uh, the relaxation and then again due to the relaxation they will, they will again come back the ventricles will be again free of blood and then again the passive flow of the blood goes there to the atrium atrium gets filled and the whole process is repeated step by step like, all over again now this is another picture to tell you about the whole scenario i keep two different pictures so that you get a better idea about all these processes now you see here again atrial systole systole uh, means when the pressure start to build up inside the atrium that's atrial systole right it forces a small amount of blood into the relaxed ventricles to go a little bit then slowly atrial systole ends and will start creating pressure so the blood will flow from atrial to the ventricle through those mitral valve and tricuspid valve over there now after that the first phase is the ventricular contraction and the av valve start to shut down or close that is the first kind of close and that closure gives you a sound first sort of sound that we observe in the lub dub then secondly uh, as the ventricular pressure start to rise it exceeds the pressure of the arteries and the semilunar valve start to open the blood start to eject outside then finally when that thing is over the ventricles relax the pressure is ventricle drops the blood flow back again uh, again uh, to the to the atrium then again the whole process begins all over again so that's the and and uh, once it start beginning once the blood is transferred they will close the semilunar valve and that will give you the second sound here so first sound here closure of the valve the uh, av valves and the second sound is the closure of the semilunar valve that's there so ultimately finally then again it will relax the atrium will be filled with passive uh, like passive filling with blood then again it will be transferred and the whole process will begin and it will cyclize like that now if we give the time duration the process of atrial systole goes from 0 millisecond to 100 millisecond then the whole process to remain complete it will take kind of 800 milliseconds in different stages so it's very very fast as you know 800 millisecond it's not exactly a second less than a second is required for this whole process to continue and complete now this is for a healthy human being for an adult healthy human being but this thing might vary with the time okay now uh, the last thing that i want to talk here about the cardiac cycle graph that's what uh, i want to talk about at the at the end and uh, if you look at here there are two more things that uh, the control of the flow of the blood the control is made like pressure changes uh, the reflect and alternative contraction and relaxation is occurring into the heart so blood moves along a pressure gradient through 
uh, like uh, different stages and the pressure changes also cause the heart valves to open and close that actually regulates the whole process those valves are designed in a way that it will open in one direction and close in the other that maintains the proper directionality of the blood flow now if you look at the cardiac cycle graph what we can see you know the during ventricular ejection phase the ventricular pressure rises higher than the aortic pressure this is necessary to open the semilunar valve otherwise semilunar valve will not open okay they need to increase the pressure in the ventricle more than the aortic pressure okay now if we look at here in this graph what you will see is the different stages di diastole and systole and then again diastole systole is the contraction phase while it will create a huge amount of pressure on the blood so that the blood will flow and diastole is the relaxation phase so in the very beginning it starts with a very new less amount of blood pressure that is 10 mmhg it starts with a closure this is the first point where the mitral valve closes because the relaxation and the blood filling of the atrium is done then once the mitral valve closes and uh, as well the tricuspid valve closes while it start to provide uh, the huge it start to build up a huge pressure there in the ventricle and that pressure that they applies in the ventricle and, and then finally uh, that pressure start to open the aortic valve remember that's what we talked about because in the ventricle the ventricular pressure should be much higher than the pressure in the aortic valve uh, pressure in the aorta otherwise the blood will not flow otherwise the aortic valve will never open so when they reach at the pressure of 80 mmhg the aortic valve opens once the aortic valve opens it creates an immense pressure onto the valves and start forcing it to reach from 80 mmhg to 120 mmhg and 120 mmhg is the highest systolic pressure one can observe there okay so at the very start point of the phase when they're in the diastole phase and the and the pressure slowly start to build up and the and the ventricle is filled with blood we get a blood pressure of 80 mmhg which is in the in the first level of pressure but then once the pressure start to build up it can reach to 120 mmhg that is the peak or highest systolic pressure that's applied by the blood now once the systolic pressure is done then it will slowly as the blood are pumped out slowly the blood pressure is falling down and then the aortic valve will be closed once the aortic valve will be closed when the pressure drops to 80 mmhg then the aortic valves will close because 80 mmhg is not uh, the kind of pressure that will remain uh, that will make the aortic valve open so it will not allow that to open so at 80 mmhg when the pressure falls aortic valve closes back and then the aortic pressure gets in the previous condition then again start the relaxation process because slowly diastole process will start to begin and again mitral valve start to open because this is the phase where the the ventricles will will be filled with blood passive flow of blood and then mitral valves start to open as they start to contract here and then uh, the pressure in the left atrium start to get down and then the left ventricle pressure also less and then slowly that will increase and do the whole process again and again throughout the time that is the whole process now if you look at this side uh, we are not going to talk about the electrocardiogram graph here because we'll be talking about electrocardiogram uh, in the intrinsic conduction system but if you look at here you will see aortic pressure left ventricular pressure and left atrial pressure now aortic pressure is changing and how it's changing this is the red line left atrial pressure is this pink line and left ventricular pressure is this yellow line so left ventricular pressure it will rise a maximum up to 120 then it will fall down a little bit uh, for a while then again it will go to so every single cycle you will see the left ventricular pressure to increase uh, a huge amount why because they need to open uh, those aortic valves there that's why the pressure increases to 180 mmhg on the other hand the aortic pressure also goes there whenever they need to transfer the blood uh, from the uh, like like aortic pressure will also increase because the whole aortic pressure is actually uh, ins inserted by by this uh, ventricular pressure as the ventricular pressure is giving the blood to the aorta so aortic pressure will also increase by that time so in both this case you will see the synchronicity in the in the pressure change 
while the left atrial pressure is completely opposing because as the blood is flowing to the ventricle and ventricle is adding uh, the construct like ventricle is adding uh, the pressure ex ex exhibiting the pressure it will be opposite to that okay so that's how we get uh, the different uh, regions of the graph and uh, this graph is going to show us what's going on exactly uh, so missynchronization of this graph uh, can uh, can cause certain effects uh, like uh, it can help us to identify if there is any issue going on with the heart transfer and so on, okay in this video we'll be talking about cardiac output and what is cardiac output okay we've been talking about uh, the cardiac cycle and also we'll be talking about the different parts of the cardiac cardiovascular system so you can watch all of our videos there cardiac output is simply the volume of blood pumped by the heart per minute okay so we calculated in the amount of blood or the volume of blood in ml pumped per minute that's how we calculate the cardiac output of a human body now this cardiac output is the function of heart rate and stroke volume these are the two things that compose that those are composing cardiac output okay the heart rate is simply the number of heart beats heart beats per second okay uh, actually if you calculating in minutes so number of heart beats per minute actually and the stroke volume is the volume of blood that is pumped out of the heart with each beat okay so this is another volume of the blood that is pumped for each beat so you multiply them together to get the value of cardiac output that's all about cardiac output so this is the amount or volume of blood that is pumped by the heart per minute calculated equals with heart rate that is the time the heart is beating per minute multiplied by the volume of blood it is pumping per each beat okay that's how we get the calculation of the cardiac output so let's look at here the goals for our learning is to recognize the cardiac output varies directly with the heart rate and the stroke volume we saw both of them and how they are linked to identify the factors that modify heart rate and stroke volume and also to know how this cardiac output is regulated and how those things change cardiac output over time now it depends that cardiac out output can be regulated in different way and for different person this and different situations as well the cardiac output may vary okay for different situations that means if you are exercising the cardiac output of your body will be different if you are relaxing and watching a movie the cardiac output may be different if you are sleeping the cardiac output may be different this is the page to tell you about the process again so it's called angiographic cardiac output or simply cardiac output equals to stroke volume multiplied by heart rate that's what we all know and the stroke volume and heart rate both are calculated in milliliters so divided by 1000 milliliter we get the actual value that we want to find out what is stroke volume we talked it earlier about the stroke volume that is the amount of uh, like blood that is pumped uh, when each beat or each heart cycle is conducted so usually the calculation is made like stroke volume equals to end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume because you know heart beats in the two different stages systole and diastole diastole is the relaxing stage when the heart is filled with the blood and systole is the contraction phase of the heart or different compartments of the heart that will push the blood to the next compartment or to the uh, aortic uh, aorta or to to the pulmonary uh, vein and all these regions okay so that's how we measure it so how we measure end diastolic volume that is the end of the blood that is left in the left ventricle during the diastole of the heart now in systolic volume we measure it the amount of blood that is present in the left ventricle after the systole that's what we can measure 
Now, what is this tool, DAS tool and what we are actually talking about? What we mean by heart to beat and heart is beating. Beating is, is the process of heart's different compartments to regularly relax and contract. And the process of heart beating and the whole process of transferring blood from the one compartment of heart to the next and then transferring it to the rest of the body as well as to the lungs known as a cardiac cycle. So, I'll very much encourage you to know about cardiac cycle first before knowing cardiac output. So, you can watch a video on cardiac cycle in our channel which can help you to get the idea. Now, once we know about that idea, we can easily calculate the cardiac output. We know the stroke volume, we know the heart rate which can be easy to calculate. Multiply them divided with 1000 ml, we get the value of the cardiac output. Now, what we know is that the cardiac output is constituent of heart rate and stroke volume. So, to increase a cardiac output, what things we can do is to increase the stroke volume or increase the heart rate or increase both. If we increase only stroke volume or the heart rate, that will lead to a simple increment of the cardiac output. But we increase, if we increase both, that will lead to a huge amount of increment in the cardiac output. Now, when we require to increase cardiac output, when our body requires a lot of blood filled with nutrients and oxygen, when we are running, exercising, we need that to increase it. So, our body have different regulatory process to increase the cardiac output as well as to decrease the cardiac output depending upon the need. These are some factors that are controlling the cardiac output process that you can see here. Okay. Okay. You see here in this case the regulation of cardiac output is this is the ultimate thing that we are regulating that is cardiac output. And there are different nervous system and release of hormones that also regulate the process of cardiac output. Now, in this picture, plus means positive regulation, minus means negative regulation. Okay, That is what we know here. So, the key factor of regulating the cardiac output is either regulating the stroke volume or the heart beat. Okay? So, it is kind of the most of the body's processes are targeting the stroke volume to regulate the cardiac output. This is what they are targeting. Okay? So, the key factor for regulating the stroke volume is the amount of stretching that occurs to the ventricular cardiac muscle prior to the ventricular contraction. So, more the cardiac muscle stretches, the more forcefully it contracts, right? Because the whole idea is contraction and relaxation. So, the more we'll stretch in the relaxation, the more that will allow it to contract. So, that will allow to put more blood with a huge pressure there. So, this stronger contraction can increase the stroke volume of the blood inside the heart. Okay? Now, normally each ventricle normally contains about 120 ml of blood by the end of the diastole. So, at the end of the systole, about 50 ml of the blood are left at each of the ventricle. That means 70 ml of the blood were pumped out from each ventricle during the systole. So, if we do a higher amount of stretching of the muscles that can give more contraction that can lead to release of more than 70 ml of blood that can release more and uh, pump more than 70 ml of blood. Let us say 80 ml of, uh, or 90 ml of blood are pumped. So, it will lead to only 30 ml remaining there. So, the stroke volume is increasing by 2 ml, 20 ml there. That is what the target of body to increase the stroke volume out there. Okay. And another thing about the heart rate is that heart beat or heart rate, that is the number of times heart beats per 1 minute. It is only average is 75 times per minute. Now, that thing cannot be so much regulated, but what we regulate is the movement of blood, the volume of the blood that is pushed out or pumped out of the, of the ventricles. That is what we can regulate and, and for regulating that, we have sympathetic nervous system to play a vital role. Sympathetic nervous system provides a positive effect 
to increase both heart rate as well as stroke volume and those sympathetic nervous system factors will be released that will allow the the higher amount of contraction that we release to pump out more amount of blood and that will also increase the heart rate a little bit along with those two things it will increase uh, the cardiac output in high amount okay so you can do a simple experiment to check it simply if you put epinephrine as a hormone to the frog's heart that will also allow it uh, to completely increase uh, the activity because epinephrine can also increase the sympathetic nervous system activity okay this is a hormone that can regulate that now on the other hand the parasympathetic part of the nervous system can prevent and can decrease the heart rate it, it allows our body to chill and to relax so it has a negative effect over there okay and another thing is the end diastolic volume that the amount of blood left there at the end of the diastole region we talked about it so if we increase that it will also give us a higher stroke volume there okay now this is uh, different stages and different parts what is regulating the process of cardiac output that is listed in this picture there are different things like increased sympathetic stimulation increased parasympathetic stimulation increased venous return slow heart rate and different things now in here we didn't, didn't talk about the venous return actually the cardiac muscle fibers are stretched by increased blood volume returning to the heart increased stretch results in greater force for the contraction that will allow more blood to move that's what we talked earlier here and that makes uh, the blood to flow so the stroke volume gets increased as well as the cardiac output increased now sympathetic stimulation we also talk about increased in sympathetic stimulation that is due to fright or anger it can also increase the heart rate as well as the uh, the the volume of the blood that will be pumped okay another thing is exercise exercise activates sympathetic you know if you look at exercise it activates sympathetic nervous system activity or if you have low blood pressure that will also increase the sympathetic nervous system activity because if the blood pressure is lower than the normal then the body will try to restore the blood pressure and thus it will try to pump more blood so that the pressure can rise that can ultimately allow to increase the cardiac output okay exercise increases you know it it increases the contractile force of the cardiac muscle so increase the stroke volume different hormones epinephrine thyroxine can also increase the stroke volume by that same fashion of increasing contraction of the cardiac muscle okay now both the higher heart rate and squeezing action of the skeletal muscle that is formed due to exercise increase the cardiac output in tremendous amount because as i told you earlier to increase cardiac amount or cardiac output we can either increase the stroke volume or increase the heart rate and both these things are increased during exercise heart rate is increased as well as due to the muscle contraction there and you know the muscle as a respiratory pumps we saw it earlier during the talk about uh, the cardiac uh, anatomy that there are muscles that are present which can squeeze uh, so these are the different muscular cells or mus muscles that that will squeeze and exert pressure on the nearby blood vessel that will allow the blood to move in a specific direction in huge force so both these things together can clear the blood and pump, pump the blood out very very fast that will lead to the generation of higher cardiac output in the time okay now that could be also related to rising blood pressure if the blood pressure reduces sympathetic activity it decreases the heart rate so if you have a high blood pressure it also increases the arterial pressure which when which mostly ventricle must overcome before stimulating the valves open so increasing this esv and decreasing the stroke volume that will ultimately lead to like cardiac output to slow down or cardiac output to be to be reduced okay now another thing is sudden drop in the volume of the blood 
so inside your blood there is a sudden drop of the blood volume due to any severe blood loss that also results in low venous return and therefore decrease the stroke volume therefore uh, decreasing the cardiac output another important thing that regulates is the excess amount of calcium the excess calcium can lead to spastic heart contractions okay so as it contracts the heart an undesirable condition that is a spastic contraction that it's not natural now that calcium also increase the stroke volume by enhancing the contracticity or contractility of this different compartments and uh, contraction ability of the heart okay that will also allow huge amount of blood to rush and can cause the cardiac output to rise so these are the different types of regulatory measures or regulatory procedures to to control the cardiac output now it depends on our body's physical condition and state that body decides to either increase the cardiac output or decrease the cardiac output to cope up with the situation to maintain healthy homeostasis of our body in this vid video lecture we'll be talking about intrinsic conduction system okay we've been talking about the cardiovascular system an intrinsic conduction system is a part of the cardiovascular system where we see how the heart starts the process of conduction and starts to beat and formation of the beat that's what we are going to form intrinsic conduction system acts the basic rhythm that the heart is beating okay and it consists of autorhythmic cardiac cells that initiate and distributes the same type of impulse throughout the heart that is known as the action potential it's known as the action potential of the cardiac cells that ultimately helps to move first generate and to move that cardiac rhythm from one area of the heart to the next so goals for our learning is to identify the components of the intrinsic conduction system to recognize that the intrinsic conduction system coordinates heart's activity by determining the direction and the speed of the heart's depolarization that's a part of uh, the card like uh, the active potential or action potential that generates due to the polarization and depolarization of ion channels that are present in the cardiac cell membrane and to relate the heart electrical activity to an ecg wave tra tracing and how ecg actually help us to find out whether your heart is beating in a proper rhythm or not now in the intrinsic conduction system overview if you look it is composed of different types of regions okay first is known as the sa node sinoatrial node internodal pathways av node atrioventricular node av bundle atrioventricular bundle bundle branches and purkinje fiber so it starts the whole process starts from the sa node and it completely distributes until the purkinje fiber so the whole impulse generated the action potential actually fired up here in the sa node okay sa node then it is distributed a transfer till the purkinje fiber and ultimately to the ventricular syncytium okay and the movement is shown here inside starts with sa node then to the a atrial syncytium junctional fibers to the atrioventricular node or av node then av bundle then bundle branches then purkinje fibers then ventricular syncytium starts point here and then slowly migrating so the nodes that we are talking about sa node is here av node is this one purkinje fibers are distributed through the endometrium here in the ventricular area now if we look at the whole process what we know about it let's find it out the sa node is located in the right atrium it initiates the depolarization impulse which in turn generates an action potential that spreads throughout the atria to the av node that's the whole process so the first process to begin with let me change the color to red that will help to understand okay so then it comes to the internodal pathway the second one 
the internodal pathway is located in the walls of the atria. These are the internodal pathways. And they link the SA node to the AV node and they distribute the action potential to the contractile cells of the atria. Then it reaches the impulse to the AV node which is located in the inferior interatrial septum. We call it interatrial septum because this is between the atrium, two different atrium. This is uh, the left, uh, this is the right atrial, this is the left atrium. So, interatrial septum is this middle layer that is separating two different atrium, it presents there. Then the impulse is transferred from AV node to the AV bundle. Now, this here the only electrical connection is present between the atria and the ventricle is the AV bundle. So, they are very important to transfer the electrical signal from AV node to the rest of the ventricular area because the major start point of this impulse is the atrium, it is not the ventricle. The only way the ventricle will get some of that is due to the AV bundle. And then it allows the action potential to move from the interatrial space or interatrial septum to the intraventricular septum and then finally connecting to the ultimate area uh, through the AV node to the bundle branches. Bundle branches are the portions of those AV bundle that are distributed called as AV bundle branches. And this AV bundle branches convey the action potential to the interventricular septum which is present between two different ventricles. Okay? And then they will finally release it to the Purkinje fiber which are further branched portion of the bundle branches. Okay? And they begin at the lower interventricular septum to the apex of the heart and then continue superiorly throughout the myocardium of the ventricles. This Purkinje fibers convey the action potential to the contractile cells of the ventricle that will help them to contract and the process of the rhythm to complete. So, the action potential which spread from the, for, from the autorhythmic cells to the intrinsic conduction system to the finally to the contractile cells are electrical events. These are all electrical events and these electrical events are developed due to the charge distribution across the cell membrane. Let us say outside, this is inside and there are different membrane proteins embedded who can transfer sodium and potassium in and out that will ultimately leads to the generation of a membrane voltage or membrane potential. Normally, the membrane potential is 72 or approximately 70 millivolt which gets altered due to the uptake and release of sodium and potassium in and out of the cell. And the subsequent contraction of the contractile cell is a mechanical event that causes the heart beat to process. So, it starts as an electrical signal in SA node, it is transferred, finally transferred to the contractile cells mostly present in the myocardium, mostly present in the ventricle area here. And once it is transferred to these contractile cells in the myocardium, those cells process this energy and convert it into mechanical energy to finally cause the heart to beat. Okay? Because electrical energy cannot help it beat, electrical energy starts the process and then finally provides it to the physical energy, mechanical energy that will help it to beat. Okay? So that is all, begin with SA node, generates the impulse excitation begins, transfer to the AV node, move through the bundle branches, reaches the Purkinje fiber and Purkinje fiber finally give that to the contractile cells that will provide the mechanical process of beating. So, if you look at ECG graph of a heart and how the rhythm of the graph, you will find this is a kind of a very uh, standard graph that you will find. You will find first a little blank, then we have a little up, then we have, have a peak, then we have a little up and again goes down, something like that. So, the first part when starts here, it will take some time. So, the lag is due to the SA node start point. Then for the AV node, you will go get this simple small arch. 
then for the bundle branches you'll get a little go down because the energy is going slow now going down now but once they reach that in the Purkinje fiber as it spread across the complete myocardium which is much stronger which is much thicker in the ventricle and they have contractile cells they now receive the signal and contraction begins so we get a huge peak there due to that contraction that's called as a ventricular excitation when it begins they will be very slow but when its excitation completes we get a higher peak then the whole process will, uh, will go again so if you look at the ECG wave the first small arch is known as a P wave then the downfall Q very rise sharp peak R and small down that is S so this is known as QRS complex together and then it goes another wave known as a T wave mostly this is due to the repolarization of those cells in the ventricular area that's why you get the T wave it makes the ventricle ready for the next type of contraction so begin with the P wave which is the depolarization begins of the atria in response to the SA node triggering that start point then we have a small downfall here it's known as PR interval that is the delay of AV node to fall allow the filling of the ventricles why the delay because once it's developed in SA node it takes some time to move to the AV node okay that's the delay then once they receive that depolarization further occurs in the ventricles triggers the main pumping contractions ultimately to the ventricles because the contraction will be for the contractile cells so huge sharp peak observed for the contraction in the ventricle then it again goes down okay here beginning of the ventricle repolarization we have a flat observed in the voltage because there is a not a huge change now because right after the sharp peak it falls down and, and they will repolarize to maintain the action potential of the membrane that's why it, we have a flat line then for a ventricular repolarization we have a, another peak which is T wave so here you can see the contraction of the ventricle let me take a color here yes contraction of the ventricle it starts uh, at the apex of the heart and moves superiorly forcing the blood upward towards the arteries to move okay. this is important because the large arteries are located superiorly so the blood has to start the process from the bottom of the heart and go up because we can't we don't need uh, something to go from top to the bottom we need a pressure to move from bottom to the top that's what is going on here now the correlation between the heart and the electrical activity and the ECG wave tracing we can easily find by looking at this P, Q, R, S and T this, this different, uh, different regions of the graph different peaks that is going to tell us an important insight okay here you see the start point of the P wave begins here from the SA node and interaction with AV node here the rest of the Q, R, S that R peak is due to the contraction of the ventricle and the ventricular contractile cells and then T is the recovery wave that ultimately shifts the heart back to the earlier con uh, condition. Okay. Now if you look at here, this is a very interesting uh, set of graphs that are going to tell you about uh, the difference between the different type of heartbeat. For a normal heartbeat, it's simply the all the phases like P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T like that. But for a very hard, uh, like very, very fast heartbeat, it's like all these waves, all these R peaks will be presented very close to each other very very close to near okay and then the slow heartbeat means you see this r peak or this peak for this r uh, side or the r wave they are placed further from each other and there's a problem with irregular heartbeat you will not find any of this kind of situations like if it's a slow heartbeat you will find that uh, all of them all of those different uh, our wave are moving in a constant distance so as the very fast beat they will be in the constant distance though the distance will be much closer but constant distance maintained but for an irregular heartbeat between two R waves the distance is high then again after that the distance is very slow very less so it will be like imbalanced heartbeat or irregular heartbeat that is denoting some sort of problem related to the uh, induction you know, I mean inter internal conduction system of the heart and also it's denoting that there is something wrong going on in the heart rhythm 
okay so for summarizing everything we can tell the intrinsic conduction system of the heart initiates the depolarization of the impulse the action potential spread through the heart causing the coordinated heart contraction event and an ecg wave can trace the records of this electrical activity that is going on in the heart in form of the heart rhythm okay so that's all about intrinsic conduction system i hope this video help you out if you like this video please hit the like button subscribe to my channel to get more and more videos of human physiology like that and definitely share this video with your friends thank you